This is a must watch for people who are honestly thinking about for the first time, what is this construct we call money? Now the title says Bitcoin 101, but we need to take a big step back to break down what causes us to need Bitcoin in the first place. We'll go through a summary of the three monetary use cases, refocus the blame of all the issues you hate to see in the world, and just WTF happened in 1971. Break through the noise, the fun all around. Stay real with the signal, got 10 toes down. Bitcoin beats, the revolution sound. We dive in the depths where the real is found. The signal stay strong, no lies in sight. We stand tall, we ready for the fight. Echoes in the dark, we see the clutch unite. It's Sir Ulrich, and are you down with the underground? The individual is the focus of every value exchange that can include goods, services, information, or money. And because a person doesn't always want a discrete consumable immediately, we use the construct of money to defer that choice to the future. The ability to exchange value is what pushes humanity forward. Division of labor, which enables us to specialize in particular skills, relying on others to provide those other needs and wants so we can prosper. Essentially, the quality of our value exchange is the foundation of the society we live in. And because money is intended to provide us optionality in our gratification, it's 50% of every transaction, with the exception of some rare, perfectly timed and weighted trades. For example, person A has this Series 1 BTC trading card pack, and person B has this rare 1991 Michael Jordan batting practice card foreshadowing his foray into baseball three years later. Deal or no deal? Lucky for me, I have both. With money being involved in half of every transaction, if the money we use is great, the value exchange benefits. If the money we use is broken, the economic actions will suffer because the incentives are screwed up. Think about this. If every car purchased in the world was defective by default and everyone knew it, how would that affect your decision to purchase your next one? You may be thinking, what exactly do I mean when I say money is broken? Surely we can go buy a sandwich from a vendor with whatever government currency we've been issued within the domain we reside. Well, maybe slightly short-sighted to suppose that money only goes that far, but I don't blame you. We are groomed by those that govern to think nothing more of it. The English word currency comes from the Latin word currere, which means to run or to flow. Related word current also means presently in effect. You can see how currency is intended to flow from one person to another while the other definition speaks to its immediacy of its value. And of course, everyone understands why I say immediacy because no one's in denial that our currency is losing its value. It's being debased, it's experiencing inflation. Famed economist Thomas Sowell said, inflation is in effect a hidden tax. The money that people have saved is robbed of part of its purchasing power, which is quietly transferred to the government that issues new money. So what is money supposed to do? Well, it's very simple. Money has three use cases and each must be optimized for society to operate the best it can. The three are storage of value, medium of exchange, and unit of account. So the store of value asset must be durable. And that means it can't have a shelf life. TikTok and Instagram trends getting ladies excited with the idea of Chanel purses being store of value and even worse sneaker bros trying to justify their obsession. Call it what it is, a novelty collectible, and your item one day will surely die. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The store value asset must be stable, not privy to wild swings in value. Isn't that funny? I can hear it now. Oh look, another Bitcoin channel that contradicts itself. Bitcoin is extremely volatile. 
Well, not this channel. Now, what exactly do I mean by that? Well, we're gonna save that one for part two. The store of value must be widely accepted. It should be easily recognized and trusted amongst a reliable network of people that would find it desirable. Picasso painting, pretty good with a chunky little commission for the intermediaries. A collection of unopened DVDs from the 2000s, you probably can't find a buyer to cover your initial investment. A medium of exchange is anything that's widely accepted as a means to facilitate the buying and selling of goods, services, or information. This is where commonly accepted money shines as a way to avoid clunky barter that forces you to trade for a good that you just may not actually want. It also should be divisible to accommodate various transaction sizes, portable transport, and easily transferable. Mr. I just want to buy a sandwich and coffee? This is your shining moment. Then there's the unit of account. And this is the standard numerical measurement to value goods, services, assets, and liabilities. This is like the, the yardstick for how we determine worth. It should be stable, able to identify small enough units to capture virtually any measure of worth, and like the measure of distance, force, or weight in our world, should not alter due to human input or preference. You see, these are the three use cases of money, and we use government fiat currency as our chief form of money. This money is broken, broken because it fails to achieve the store of value as monetary debasement, which most people call inflation, continually kills its purchasing power. In fact, the longer you hold local fiat currency, the more rapidly it debases as the government continually makes more to pay their bills from spending the money they don't really have. This helps them, but hurts you and makes it increasingly harder to buy assets for yourself. This slowly creates a bifurcated society of owning class and renting class, and this is not by choice. But fiat currencies aren't the only money. Remember the three use cases. Items like gold, fine art, houses are used as money as well. And due to their respectable level of scarcity and long shelf life and general acceptance as subjectively valuable, they're ideal candidates to store value in contrast to, or even more accurately, to escape from the diabolical state of fiat currencies. Now, however, these assets are not perfect and have weaknesses because they essentially enrich the intermediaries at the expense of the owner due to the need for complex handling or security. And if the owner is ever in need to access liquidity quickly, these items become a liability just as fast. And this is due to the cost of transaction, transportation, the time to find a willing party to exchange, as most of these items, even gold, is just not very fungible. Now, as for the unit of account for the world, it's generally USD, and all currencies respond to the state of the dollar. But let me ask you, can you in good confidence tell me what you can buy for a dollar? And if I asked you that 20 years ago, would you have a different answer? <laughs> of course you would. Now, why is it 20 years ago you could tell me how long a mile was or how heavy a kilogram was and it still remains the same to this day. You see, those are true examples of units of account. It does not change. Why would you use a unit of account that 100 years ago could buy you 32 chocolate bars and today can't even buy you one? Why do Europeans make fun of the English measurement system, but they're numb to the system used to determine value? Hypocrisy or blinded by a controlled narrative? We're told that inflation is good for society. In fact, we're told by Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve and the most powerful person in the world, that 2% is the target inflation rate. A brief visit to the low twos uh, at the end of, but I mean, I mean sustainably, durably underlying inflation between two and two and a half is what I would say. That would be, that would be a great outcome. Well, if that's the case, what does that say about nations that never get anywhere close to 2%? What's best for them and why are they different? Should everyone in these countries replace their leaders like yesterday? What happens if the inflation's at 6% in one year? In 2022, it went way above that. Should we be at negative two inflation or 2% deflation the next year? 
just to average it out? But why does the Fed not take those steps? What is this construct that creates more questions the more you think about it? You aren't supposed to think about the benefactors from this system of economics. This is called the Cantillon effect. And to be brief, it means the people closest to the entity that creates the money will benefit from money creation and those furthest will be hurt. Simply put, closer, richer, further, poorer. If you feel poorer every year, assuming all inputs are pretty much equal, you're a victim of this dynamic. Exercise for the viewing audience. I want you to take a step back from the world you know. Breathe out all the preconceived notions, internal biases, and favorite famous people that you give preferential treatment. Use the rational side of your head. We're talking about the ability to acquire goods and services. Is it logical for anyone to have the ability to acquire goods and services with something they made up out of thin air? How many pizzas can one entity buy before you start to ask, is something wrong with the rules we're playing by? How many houses can one entity buy with this unique power before it artificially raises the cost of houses? And since we know that illogical power does exist, what determines the right of one group versus another group from creating the money to be made ad infinitum? Even better, why not just print enough money so that no one goes hungry or homeless in your nation? There's enough money to buy food and shelter for all the people in at least one country. What are they doing with this power? With all the activists politicking one way or another during election season, why do none of them consider anger at the ones in power who can manifest their wishes immediately? Why do you hate corporations that simply work out the avenues to prosperity outlined for them? Why do you get frustrated at someone online telling you your food is full of GMOs or polyester is bad for you because you can't afford quality consumables? Why not get mad at the ones who actually make this happen? In 1971, Richard Nixon ended the direct international convertibility of the United States dollar to gold, making foreign dollars irredeemable. With all the euro dollars across the world, this completely severed paper money's relationship to gold henceforth and created a de facto dollar standard since every bank in the world had dollars in their reserves. This triggered not only an insanely volatile gold market during the 70s, but so many different economic phenomena that are accelerating even more today. And I'm not just talking about real estate prices going up or interest rates for lending becoming increasingly smaller. I'm talking about a reduction in the ratio of productivity to compensation, stagnation in the economic advancement of black Americans, increasing the number of dual income houses, yet buying power has fallen, cumulative inflation at a breakneck trajectory, quadrupling the average time it takes to save for a house. Banking crises once were nearly non-existent are now an annual occurrence. But I'm not through. The average number of hours to work to buy the S&P fund has quadrupled. Lawyers and prisoner rates have risen. Physics PhDs have decreased. Mass shootings before that date were non-existent. Now they are seasonal. But gun regulations have risen. Divorce rates have tripled, child obesity has quadrupled, seed oil production has increased 21 times greater. While we spend more money on healthcare, people are sicker than ever before. So go ahead and tell me everything is fine. Like I said at the beginning, the quality of our value exchange is the foundation of the society we live in. These problems, whether they would exist or not, have been exacerbated by the skewed incentives of politicking with the money printer rather than attempting to provide a quality supply for a legitimate demand. Economics 101 is seemingly ignored by all the economists. As for you, congrats, you completed Bitcoin 101, the fiat problem. Next time it's Bitcoin 201, the hard money solution. I am Sir Ulrich, like my father before me. Bitcoin fixes this. Never wait, never wait, never wait, never wait, never wait, never wait.